Today on the show, I'm happy to have David Van Bruen. He's a CEO of Fairly AI. They have all your compliance needs for AI in one spot. So you had a realization recently that what you were working on in ethical AI actually really played well in, as an enterprise model. So what were you working on? How did that come about? So in my uh, previous company, I had built some methodologies that we were practicing in order to bring natural language processing tooling into production in a responsible way. This was stuff that was not in my mind at the level that a large enterprise would be working. After I had uh, sold the company, I continued to think about the various ways that artificial intelligence can go very badly when it's not properly tested, when people who are not actually um, sophisticated in the technology, nonetheless, are responsible for making decisions about how it's used, how it's optimized, uh, how much money is spent on doing these things, and then ultimately having a system around it. I had many ideas that I had been uh, working on. And I was giving a lecture at a conference on ethical AI. I spoke to people from a lot of large companies, academics, and as a result of that, it just dawned on me that no one's actually doing this in any kind of serious way. And everything uh, that I had inside of myself was a unique thing that I could offer to this world. And I thought maybe I could do actually do this as a company. Yeah. So you sell your last company and you start the next business right away? I had a kid in between, but he was about three months old and I could have just gone for some time, but I have no idea how it happened. Sleepless nights with the child and somehow a company started in the middle of it. I guess I just, I can't stop. Yeah. It seems like you have that entrepreneurship bug. Yes. And I would have never thought that. I didn't grow up dreaming of being an entrepreneur. It just happened. How did the first business start then? If that wasn't the plan? I, yeah. I was teaching at uh, University of Waterloo in Canada. And I was asked to do some consulting work on a social media scanning technology. I uh, built it in my spare time. Somehow I, I got turned into the CEO a few years later and I ran the company for some time and then I managed to sale and continued running the subsidiary. I want to talk about the sale because that's, if you weren't even planning to run a business and then you get an exit, like yeah. what, how did that come about? What was that journey? Uh, when you inherit a company, there's a whole lot of things that you have no clue about and have to learn very quickly. And perhaps it's a good thing sometimes that you just don't have any preconceptions of what's normal and what's the expected likelihood of things happening. So I just went hard on all fronts and it was a lot of ups and downs, certainly, but I just didn't give up and went through, I don't know how many conversations until something just worked and the CEO of the company that made the acquisition and I just gelled in an hour conversation. Everything made sense. So let's just do it. Now it, it didn't just happen. It took five, five flights to Europe, all kinds of due diligence, bringing in lawyers and all the investors have to get in line. And then you have to maintain enthusiasm through months, which it's easy to get someone impressed one time, but to maintain that level of enthusiasm is that whole other thing. So it's not for the faint of heart. Now that you've had that experience with this new venture, are you, do you have the end in mind that I want to sell this one day? I expect that we will go for an exit at some point. It's nonetheless a very big idea. So having the next generation of artificial intelligence going out of the research labs and into actual production use means and with regulations piling up and I'm, I'm not just talking about AI regulations, but existing, uh, regulations that AI can fall foul of. If you own the compliance layer for that, you own the 
actual ability to make use of it. You can turn it on and off. It's huge. So I have large ambitions, but I don't know the future. Yeah. So that I can understand your business more and our listeners can. So you're going to come in to basically anybody who's built the model and make sure you have the compliance aspect covered. So it, it's something that can be run at any stage of the life cycle of a model. So you can start, what's best is to start when you're building a model to know what the actual policy requirements are that you have to uh, keep up with and then do testing as so we do automated testing and match that to things like the consumer financial protection bureau, the, all the ISO standards that are relevant to it, fair lending act, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just a whole lot to take care of. And so instead of spending $2 million and a year on a project and at the end, hand it over to compliance and get shut down, you can front load it. But that also works for all the fintechs who are building AI enabled B2B products. They want to sell to large enterprise. They have to give confidence and comfort that the models are going to not cause major legal risks by using our system is enormous value add when you're trying to sell AI to enterprise. You can scan a model once and fill out the information, generate all the necessary reports for the full coverage, but even better is to be continuously scanning as the models are developed, built, monitored, and ultimately rebuilt and improved on new data. So that well, now I see why your business has the potential to really so <laughs> massive. You're going to be this protection layer that con comes into any AI and says, okay, we can get you instant compliance through proper documentation. Okay. Yeah. All right. I got this, David. I oh, see this one. Good. I see why you came out of retirement oh, so quickly. Oh, yeah. I'm on a mission to make AI boring again, but it's really exciting because it provides a foundation. So if you're spending a day building a model and the year getting it past compliance and you can shorten that year. That means you can do so much more on the innovation side. And that's what I'm really passionate about. So what stage are you guys at in the deployment of this? So we've built the product with a few really big logos in banking, in the global standards institution, a very large consultancy and working with partners like the CC, the, the product is at a place now where it can be installed very quickly in highly secure settings. It doesn't communicate outside of it, runs the tests autonomously, and then communicates with a platform. The platform can be in our SaaS as a managed service, but we're also putting it out into a private cloud uh, marketplace. We'll be making some announcements about that shortly, but that's for the fall. And then a, a large enterprise can have everything locked down and yet cover a large number of different model types and requirements. Very cool. I have a question around entrepreneurship itself. Yes. So you come up with these big ideas and then you move, put, move them into execution. What's your advice to startup founders or people thinking about starting their first business? Your job is to have a vision, refine it but hold that vision. And that's incredibly difficult because you get pulled in so many different directions and it just takes an enormous leap of faith. And the odds of succeeding are incredibly low. If you just look at the number of people that get started to the people that are able to do say an exit or get even into some incubators, be thousands of applicants and very few that actually get through. But if you have ability to hold that idea and just uh, embrace all the absurdities, somehow the world seems to just bend to your will over time. <laughs> and the magical things always happen that completely break the odds. So you have to do everything if it comes up and there's no one to do it. So hold the vision and believe in yourself. There we go. Everybody hold the vision. If our listeners wanted to get in touch with Fairly AI or, or reach out, how could they do? Best bet would be go to our website, fairly.ai, 
we have uh, email info at fairly.ai or reach out to me or someone on my team on LinkedIn and we'll take it from there. Thank you, David, for coming on the show. And thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. Make sure to smash that subscribe button. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki, and we'll see you next time. Yeah.